G'day legends. I am very lucky to have New Zealand all-rounder Daryl Mitchell with me today. G'day Daz. Hey mate, how you going? Going very well, thank you. How are you? How are things over there in New Zealand? Yeah, it's obviously heading into winter now, so it's a little bit colder, so it makes those uh, early morning sessions at the moment a bit freezing, but um, yeah, no, all good here. And you've obviously, the season has finished over there for sort of club, um, state cricket, but you've got a tour coming up. So what does your time look like at the moment? What are you up to uh, now? Uh, yeah, so we got, we finished uh, about probably two weeks ago now. Um, so it was nice to spend a little bit of time at home with the family and the kids. But um, yeah, training sort of doesn't really stop. We've got a tour to the UK in, in about another two weeks time. So uh, you're getting as, as all the running and all the weights and stuff in um, to try and, yeah, sort of get the body ready for a big tour and um, just started hitting some balls and following again this week. So, yeah, it's all all back on again, which is good fun. Yeah, when you're an international cricketer these days, you don't get too much of a break, do you? So you've got to sort of stay fit and use little pockets of time to sort of have a break and relax where you can. Um, before we sort of get too far into your international cricket and where you're at right now, I want to take it back to the start. I want to take it back to your childhood. You, you sort of grew up in a sporting family. Your father's a, a famous All Black and, and a rugby coach. What are your earliest memories of cricket and what was your childhood like with cricket? Um, yeah, I always, always loved my cricket. Um, I guess, yeah, having a dad who followed him around the world uh, with rugby, traveling winter to winter pretty much. So, um, yeah, something that uh, we always, you yeah, know, always watch cricket on TV. And I remember as a little kid watching the Boxing Day tests and things like that at home. Um, and yeah, it was something that as a, every sort of New Zealand kid, you wanted to be an all black in the winter and a black cap in the summer. And I was definitely one of those. So, um, yeah, we always had a ball in my hand. Um, I lo even now I love all sports. Um, and yeah, just sort of grew up, uh, playing as many sports as I could really. Yeah. And so if you're going winter to winter, obviously cricket being a summer sport, how old were you when you started playing cricket competitively? Um, so, uh, yeah, obviously with dad's job, we've, we've traveled all around the world. We've spent a bit of time. I was born in New Zealand and then moved to England for a little bit. Um, and then moved back home again to New Zealand. And, um, yeah, it's probably about year four at school. So what's that? Eight, nine, ten, somewhere around there. I started playing some cricket and, um, yeah, I, luckily enough, I was sort of, um, I was always a bit bigger, uh, than all the other kids at, at that age. So I could, try and bully and hit the ball as hard as I could. And yeah, luckily enough, I sort of grew a love for the game. And um, yeah, definitely in the summer, I was yeah, pretty passionate about it. So at what age then did you think, I love cricket, I'm okay at it, and maybe it's something I want to pursue? No doubt coming from a sporting background, you thought professional sport was a great thing. It was an <laughs> option. But when did you sort of think cricket is for me and I want to chase it? Um, I, I guess always in the back of your mind, it's something that you dream of. Um, yeah, like personally, I've, always wanted to play for New Zealand. So that's always in the, in the back of your head. See, uh, growing up, guys like Stephen Fleming, Chris Cairns, you know, the, as, a, as a 10 year old boy watching them play. And then obviously moving to Australia for a little bit as well, seeing Ricky Ponting and that, you're like, oh, it'd be pretty cool to, to do that for a job. So um, yeah, I, I probably, to be honest, didn't really uh, think it was even at what, finishing school that it was a real chance of, of making a living out of it. Um, but luckily enough, yeah, a few things fell my way and a little bit of hard work and, yeah, um, here we are today. But, yeah, you sort of even now you pinch yourself and, and think how lucky you are to do this for a job. Yeah, no doubt lucky to do it, but I think you're being pretty modest with a little bit of hard work and a lot of luck. I think it's probably the other way around, a lot of hard work and, and a bit of luck along the way, which everybody needs. Um, take us back to your teenage years, obviously moving around. You came to Perth when you were here in Perth and that's when we sort of, had a few battles when you were here in Perth, but year 10, you were here for about five years. Tell us about your teenage years. Were you, you were playing a bit of uh, rugby in the winter, a bit of cricket in the summer, and, and were you training flat out? Were you really trying to chase your, your dreams and your goals, or was it just a bit of fun at that point? Um, yeah, so I was moved to Perth uh, year 10 at school, so about, I think I was 15 years old. Dad had he'd just been the All Black coach, um, lost the World Cup semi-final to Australia. Um, got the sack and so we moved over to Perth as a family uh, for him to be with the Western Force and uh, at the time didn't really want to come over. I was, I was quite happy at the high school I was in, in New Zealand and um, I remember they took me to Hale and I saw the, what is it, 15 grass cricket nets or whatever and I thought, yeah, okay, I can probably, I can probably deal with this. So um, yeah, obviously I was, I was very lucky 
to go to um, to Hale and, and to play the, the PSA school system there, um, to be able to play two-day cricket, I think really uh, helped my game um, at that young age. And um, yeah, obviously played rugby in the winter and, and it's something that I do love my rugby, but I think cricket was probably always going to be the, the sport that I really loved. And um, yeah, I guess, yeah, played for the school stuff. Um, probably the big turning point for me was actually meeting Noddy Holder. Um, he was sort of, he's been my, my mentor for, um, yeah, 10, 15 years now. And, um, yeah, to meet him at 15 years old and, and get him to sort of teach me the, how he, his, his, yeah, theories behind batting and, and life itself. Um, you know, obviously very grateful. I don't think I'd be sitting here today without having someone like him to help teach me the game. So I think he played a, a massive role, um, being at Revo Sports there. Yeah, awesome. And he's had a huge impact on so many um, Western Australian cricketers and, and cricketers from all over the world who've come to Perth for, for many, many years. Um, now, you, you tell us about the impact your parents have had on your career. Obviously, your dad is a, is, as I've said, and we've said he's a famous rugby person. He comes from a professional sporting background. No doubt your mother has had a big impact as well. I, I sort of saw somewhere that you said, it was cool growing up. I got to watch the All Blacks and the Chiefs train and be around professional sport, which probably helped me create who I am and how I go about things today. So tell us a little bit more about the impact your parents have had and, and seeing what your dad does growing up. Yeah, uh, you get this question a little bit, I guess. And it's um, it's a funny one because growing up, that's all you know. It's just your dad goes off to work like like every other dad does. And it just happened that instead of going to an office or something, he'd be going telling rugby players how to chase a rugby ball. So, um, yeah, at, at the time, I probably you probably don't realise how lucky you are that you're around a, a professional environment and a high-performance environment. You know, as a kid, used to go down and watch trainings, catch the balls, like, I remember standing behind the post at 10 years old or 12 years old and catching Dan Carter kicking goals or Johnny Wilkinson when we were even younger. And, um, yeah, you look back now and you're like, actually, that's that was pretty cool. Um, and, yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's certain things that have rubbed off in my lifestyle and how I how I go about being a professional athlete um, from watching um, all those guys uh, from five years old train and, and seeing how when dad comes home grumpy about a certain player doing something stupid or not doing this and that, you think it probably has, yeah, rubbed off. Um, but at the same time, I think, yeah, it, it was just, it was my mum and my dad. Dad went off to work and yeah, I was just very lucky that, um, yeah, he was obviously a rugby coach. And, 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 and again, it obviously allowed me opportunities in life to, to do things that um, travel around the world and follow sport which you know a lot of uh, young kids don't get that opportunity to so you're yeah, very lucky. Yeah and, I, and you mentioned how at year 10 you didn't want to leave New Zealand um, to come to Perth but sometimes you just got to do what you got to do. Now let's go back to that period. Um, you, you were here for four or five years you, you sort of finished your schooling here started university here you played for Western Australia under 19s with, with Mitch Marsh and a few other guys um, you played a lot of bit of first grade cricket for Scarborough, which is where I played against you a few times. Talk us through that period and, and then what was it that took you back to New Zealand? Was it that you didn't think you'd get a look in here in WA? Was it there were more opportunities in New Zealand? What, what sort of took you back there and, and what was going on during that period here? Yeah, I guess um, even to go back to that end of school into Scarborough, I think, you know, uh, looking back now, I was, I was very lucky that um, we actually had a, a good little group of mates, uh, the likes of Marcus Stornis, Marcus Harris, um, and, and some other guys who are, who are some of our best mates now. We actually finished school, went to uni and that, but we pretty much trained with each other every day. And what we, we did it because, yes, we, we just loved playing cricket. We wanted to be the best we could be. And um, it was almost like our own little mini academy there at Revo for a little bit, even though yeah, we, it wasn't obviously organised, but uh, I think that played a massive role in the development of, of me as a player, being able to, yeah, work with those guys and, and obviously have Noddy over, uh, oversee us and help us as well. Um, I think that, yeah, those formative years of from 17, 18, 19, um, playing first grade cricket for Scarborough, luckily enough to play be a part of a, a pretty strong Scarborough team and win a few flags along the way as well. And um, I think that really... Yeah, helped fast track my game um, in many ways. You know, Scarborough only I probably batted seven, I think, and bowled about fourth change. But to be around those guys, Clinton Heron, uh, Justin Langer, um, Theo Theodoropoulos, Ty Hopes, all those guys who dominated great cricket for so long um, just helped progress my game a lot quicker. And 
um, yeah, I guess yeah, you look back now and you think actually that that's really helped shape the player that I am and today. So um, yeah, that was obviously the that bit. Um, and then yeah, uh, got a got a chance to come back and play. Un, I think it was like a futures under twenty threes uh, tournament here in New Zealand. Um, and yeah, personally, I've always always wanted to play for New Zealand, even though I was I was over there playing uh, WN nineties and stuff. It, it just wouldn't have felt right. So ended up playing wearing green and gold or something like that but yeah but wouldn't have sat properly so um yeah to have the opportunity to come back home to New Zealand and and play for Northern Districts which was the team that I'd I'd grown up in um I played under 14s under 15s for um and then yeah went and and scored a few runs in under 20s under I think it was under 21s or yeah tournament at 19 years old um and then got offered a contract for that next summer to come back and and um, yeah, sort of start my my life as a cricketer over here. So um, yeah, very I, again, like you look at, at small moments in your career that at the time you just you're going out and competing and trying to do a job. And um, yeah, for me to score, I think the first game I scored a hundred. And um, if I'd nicked off for a duck, I probably wouldn't be sitting here today. But um, yeah, certain little things happen along the way that you look back and go, yeah, happy days that that happened. And um, yeah, here we are. Yeah, well, it's about taking the opportunities you get, I guess. And how did how did someone get in contact with you to go back? Was that you chasing Northern Districts or did someone from the pathways earlier on realise, oh, he's in Perth playing grade cricket, let's get him back? How did that work? Yeah, so there's a, there's a, um, a coach who was, my, I think he was my ND under-15s coach at the time. Um, he was one of the Northern District selectors and, yeah, sort of just kept in contact a little bit. And, yeah, the opportunity arose to come back for that tournament and, yeah, I jumped at it at the time. I was, you know, playing for Scarborough and I, you know, there's got guys way better than I was in WA, like Mitch Marsh, Stoin, um, they're miles, miles ahead of where I was as a player. So uh, the opportunity for me to come back home and, and yeah, and, and be able to do this for a job and, and just, to be honest, just play cricket. I, I just love the game. So to be able to compete and, and to be able to do that, um, well, yeah, I just jumped at the chance. And yeah, obviously it was nearly near as much money as, um, as what a domestic contract something over in Australia was at the time. But um, yeah, to, to be able to jump to that and, and just be able to yeah, play cricket for a living was pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I just want to take a moment to sort of congratulate you and, and say well done because going back to that period, like you said, you were sort of batting seven, bowling probably second or third change and playing against you a few times. I personally, from my memory, I don't think I thought, oh, this kid's going to be an international cricketer. So to have gone to New Zealand to have made that sacrifice and, and change of lifestyle when you had your close group of mates here and you were enjoying, you're doing reasonably well here, to have then plugged away, which we're going to talk about now, to, to now be an international cricketer, I think is really, really inspiring. I think it's a full, full credit to you and, and your work ethic and, and all the, the, the sort of sacrifices you've made along the way. So, yeah, congratulations on everything you've done. Um, and I think it, it really gives hope to a lot of young players that, there isn't just one path to being an international cricketer and, and you're all coming up to your 30th birthday. You will hopefully have another six, seven, eight years as, a, as an international player and have a really decorated career at the end of it all. And not everyone breaks in at 21 or 23 and, and, and your story, I think, will inspire a lot of 14, 15, 17-year-olds who might not be the best right now. So well done. No, th yeah, and thanks for that. But I think also, I think it's a blessing in many ways to have not made it at 19 or 20 because I think it allowed me to learn my game at at one stage at Scarborough, then the next stage at WA19s. What it like? It meant that I was actually allowed to have some failures and have some and some learnings along the way. So that hopefully now, when I do get the chance, um, obviously had a small taste already, but more chance of international cricket that I've actually been through failings which has tested my not only my technique and but also my character and my person and the person I am and I think that yeah I look at that as a blessing that hopefully yeah um it's going to help me in the in the years to come so that I'm not sort of a deer in the headlights as a, as, as I would have been if I had played at 19 or 20 differently mm -hmm. absolutely very very true um so now those first few years back in New Zealand you, you played in the tournament you got a contract did you play straight away in the first team? Did you have to plug away for in, in grade cricket for a while? Or how did that first few years look? Um, so, yeah, first year, um, I, was, I was quite lucky. My first year with Northern Districts, we won the Plunkett Shield, which was pretty cool. And um, at that stage, sort of, 
Uh, Corey Anderson was the main all-rounder, and then there was obviously there was Trent Bolt, um, who was sort of on the verge. We just made New Zealand, but he was doing well. And we had a lot of really good senior players, like we got a chance to play with Dan Vittori, Scott Styrus, uh, the Marshall Twins. Um, and for me, that was really that was really cool because I, I sort of grown up as a little kid watching those older guys and um, yeah, to just to learn off them that first year. Uh, I think I played maybe handful of one days and one first class game the last one of the season when we won the trophy which was pretty cool um but yeah just played a lot of second 11 cricket which is a a, a cricket over here and yes uh, just sort of again let my let my game um keep trying to bang out as many runs as i possibly could and yeah just keep trying to learn as much as i can from that environment and, and off those guys knowing that hopefully one day they get a bit older and i might get a chance so um yeah the first year that was sort of that and then the next summer um, actually, yeah, I had, a, I had a decent summer and um, it sort of, yeah, opened my eyes. I'm um, actually good enough to play at the at the yeah, first class level and, and that was really cool and really rewarding. Yeah, awesome. And you obviously started university here in Perth and then after a couple of years, you shifted back to New Zealand. Is that something you carried on with um, as a backup or is that something you continued to do or where did you do, what did you do outside of cricket? Yeah, so I did a sports science degree at Edith Cowan. Um, and yeah, I, I, I was lucky that sort of worked out that as I moved over, I was sort of the last year in a bit of my uni degree. So I made sure that I got that, got that done um, by either coming back to Perth for a couple of exams or, or sitting them in New Zealand at times as well, um, just to make sure that I got that finished. And mum was pretty, pretty big on making sure that I had something outside of cricket, uh, not only just to help um yeah if if this didn't work but um just to have a balance as well I think it's crucial that you don't just live and breathe cricket 24 7 because it's obviously a, a pretty tough game at times and if you um yeah if you don't have a, a balance and things outside of the game it can definitely consume you so yeah it's something even now I keep trying to find uh, different things to keep keep myself occupied and I'm lucky I've got two daughters now which definitely keep me on my toes and keep me <laughs> yeah pretty balanced as as you well know so um yeah yeah, it's uh, yeah, pretty full on, but I, I like to have um, other things outside of the game as well. Yeah, cool. Let's go a bit deeper into that because that's a question I had for you um, later on, but we'll get into it now. It's something that so many people struggle with, especially people who think a lot about the game, think deeply about the game, is disconnecting sort of their cricket from their life and having other things to take their energy and attention away from cricket so that they can give their full energy and attention to cricket when they need to. What are the things you've done sort of in your teens and your 20s? You obviously mentioned uni and studying, but you've got your daughters now. But in those years before you had your daughters, what were sort of your, your passions outside of the game and how did you get away from cricket? Yeah, I think it's it's something you do learn as you go. Um, I, if I look back over the last, what has it been, 10 years now, there's definitely times where it's consumed me and, and I've sort of, I wish if I, if I went back now, I could say it's, it is just a game that doesn't sort of... Um, how you go in the game of cricket doesn't define the person you are, if that makes sense. Like um, whether you have a good or bad day, for me now coming home, my two girls, they're still going to smile at me whether I score a duck or a hundred. And um, yeah, so that that's probably mainly one of the big reasons why I've, I've been successful, I think, in the last few years is because I don't live and breathe by every um, score or, or game that we play as much as, don't get me wrong, I, I love competing and I hate losing, but um on a personal point of view, yeah, I think that that balance of um, yeah having things outside of the game, and I think it's different for everyone. So for me, before kids, um, I loved a bit of PlayStation. So I'd sit, that would be my sort of my time out. Um, obviously, my wife would hate me being on there too much because you want to hang. But uh, no, nah, it's it's um, yeah, that would be one way I'd get away. And, and then just lots of coffees with mates. I think um, just being able to get outside, of, especially outside of cricket circles, and just yeah, be able to hang with your friends and just, yeah, do the everyday things I, I think we definitely take for granted. So, um, yeah, I think the less you can be defined by the game of cricket, the better in many ways. And that to me is, is a huge message that I'm trying to instill in my young athletes, the sort of 16 and 17 year olds. I listened to a great podcast a while ago um, with Ben Crow, who is Ash Barty, the tennis player's mentor. And he spoke about how Ash... Barty um, fell out of love with tennis. She actually played in the women's big bash for a season, quit tennis. And then since she sort of was able to 
uh, define herself not just as a tennis player, but as a person who played tennis and had other things in her life, she's then become the world number one. So I think that what you're saying there is having perspective that it's just a game. It's a big part of your life but it is still just a game and you've got so many other things. You're a father, you, you like PlayStation, you like your mates, you da, 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 da. That allows you and allows individuals to be able to just go and play with a bit more freedom and a little bit less anxiety or worry about what if I fail. Yeah, and I think, yeah, as a, as a young kid, having that, for me, having that degree, knowing that if cricket didn't work out, I'd actually be able to go and find a job of some sort that would keep me uh, stimulated as well. I think that, that was a big part early on because it allowed me to go and play the game with freedom. Um, but don't get me wrong, at the same time, like you want to make the most of everything you do as a cricketer. Um, so I think it's really cool because it allows you, when you show up to work each day, it's like, right, I'm going to be the best player I can be today and keep trying to get better. But then at the same time, you come home and how you went that day. It, it, and the big picture of thing that it doesn't really matter, but to you obviously it does. If that, yeah, yeah, so it's, yeah, I think yeah. it's, it's really important to have that balance. Absolutely, absolutely. Great message for any young players watching. Now, going back to that period, you, you sort of did well that second season, average 50-odd. Um, you got picked in a New Zealand A tour to the subcontinent, which, um, and then it was about six years or so till you played your first, made your international debut. So in that period, there must have been some ups and some downs. Um, tell, talk us through that sort of six-year period. You're obviously very close when you went away with New Zealand Day. You were sort of next in line, but you didn't quite make it for another six seasons. What happened in that time? Yeah, I guess when I first started um, playing first class, I was, I was quite, a, how do I put it, quite a stubborn character. So, I, you know, I've come up, I've got this technique. This is how I play. This is what I do. Um, obviously did well the first year, and that probably reinforced that this is how I want to play the game. Um, go to India and Sri Lanka on an eight-week trip to New Zealand eh, and get spun out and think grow, from growing up in New Zealand and then Perth, never even never experienced any conditions like that. And I thought my game would be able to handle uh, playing in those conditions. And yeah, obviously it didn't go as well as I would have liked. Um, and it probably opened my eyes that, okay, actually I do need to, to be adaptable and be able to actually... Um, adapt my game to different scenarios and conditions. I can't just play one way all the time. So before um, that, before that, sorry to cut you off, did you have potentially a coach at Northern Districts or Noddy or someone saying, hey, I think you should try this or let's do that, but you were a little bit stubborn and thought, nah, what I'm doing works. I don't need to try something different. Um, yeah, in a way, I get like, I think, so yeah, growing up with Noddy, like, Again, I think the way he's set up my game has been um, yeah, massive and the principles that he's taught me are still massive in my game now. Um, but I think then when you have a lot of, uh, you'll experience it with kids that you work with now that you've got all sorts of coaches, whether it's a your professional coach or this coach or this coach, all trying to throw you different ideas and different techniques that they, they want you to play like. Um, and I think at times it was either I was too open and just took it all in and changed changed grips, changed my stance, squared off, whatever. And then it was, wasn't probably until I went, okay, this is how I want to play. What are my strengths? What's going to make me score the most runs I can? And I look back and it's actually probably what I was doing when I was 16, 17, actually. But then being able to adapt those strengths that I can negate the weaknesses and use those strengths to score runs well, the whole time on my elbow is, okay, what's going to make me the best player I can And then how do I, all the other stuff that gets me out, how do I just almost cover that so that I can play to my strengths again? I think that was a, that's a, that was a long process of, of rec that was over probably the course of those five years. Um, and yeah, all sorts of coaches thrown. And, and, and it's, I think it's part of professional sport is that um, you do get all sorts of ideas thrown, whether it's coach or when you get, to higher levels, whether it's the media doing the same thing, I think you need to be stubborn in some ways to be able to stick to what you know and works, but at the same time be adaptable so that you can keep improving. Yeah, and so very, very profound advice, and and yeah, I think great advice for everyone. And, and like you say, at 16, 17, the better you get, the more eyes you have on you, the more people that want to help and get involved. So it's about listening and trying to take in the information and work out if it makes sense maybe trying it if it doesn't work for you then and sort of sticking to what works 